I'm super pumped to announce Ryan Leslie on stage. Is, is my microphone working? Can, can you guys hear me loud and clear? I feel like Justin Timberlake up here. So I got the, you know, or Bieber, or what, either one. But, um, so yeah, so, so you guys are catching me right now in the midst of a, a, of a 30 city European run. And um, I actually happen to be really good friends, um, almost family, uh, with Peter Sign back there, um, who came to visit me in New York City and invited me to come and share some insights uh, with young entrepreneurs. So where shall we start? I mean, I, I, I've gotten a really great introduction. Uh, and uh, I think probably one of the most interesting pieces of the story that may have been left out is once I graduated from Harvard, everyone in my family expected that there was going to be something incredible that was going to happen. And um, in my freshman year at school, I fell in love with music. Now, uh, it, it's a little bit different because growing up, my, my parents, have, they've always been musicians. So from the very beginning, my mother, a classically trained pianist, my father, a trumpet player. And um, I came along kind of unexpectedly in their life pathways and they rearranged their lives to raise me and my sister. And in my freshman year of school, I was listening to these records and someone introduced me to the music of Stevie Wonder. Now you might say, well, I mean, you were, you know, already 14, 15 years old and you'd never heard of Stevie Wonder before. And that's because my parents are pretty religious. And so um, I started to do some research. Now this is pre, this was like in 1994. So this was pre, oh, I could just Google Stevie Wonder. I had to go to Harvard's Widener Library. I checked out a book on Stevie Wonder and I realized that he had released his first album at the age of 11 or 12, it was called Fingertips. And I called my father and I said, Dad, I, 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 I'm behind. He said, well, Ryan, you're 15 years old at Harvard. How are you behind? I said, well, you know, uh, <laughs> I, said, I said, well, you know, I've decided I want to do music. And my new musical hero, Stevie Wonder, and he released his first album when he was 11 or 12. And I'm like four or five years behind him. So I'm changing my major. I was pre-med. And uh, I'm changing my major because I want to take as few classes as possible so I could focus all my time on music. So I actually took a few classes at the Kennedy School of Government because they only required that I go to class like once a semester. And the whole class was based on a great final paper. So if I wrote a great final paper and it was 70% of the grade, I could still get a C in the class and I could pass. And I was on academic probation three times while I was at Harvard. But I still managed to graduate on time. And my parents, you know, uh, even now, as much as I've achieved and, you know, different awards and nominations and everything, my goal is still to become more famous than Harvard. Why? Because when my dad tells people about his son, you know, he, he says, well, you, you know, um, hey, have you heard of my son? You know, his, his name is Ryan Leslie. And people say, no, I, I never heard of him. Oh, he went to Harvard. Oh, I heard of that. <laughs> So my goal is eventually one day to get more famous than Harvard. So then my dad, actually, when he introduces me to people, he actually could just say my name. And, uh, you know, it, 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 the shining moment of his, uh, you know, job as a parent was the fact that I went to Harvard, right? Now, coming out of Harvard, um, uh, w what wasn't conveyed a little earlier in the story was that I came out of Harvard and literally... I had an idea for a business, right? Now, it wasn't for a huge business. It was just for what I call a lifestyle business. And a lifestyle business is a business that makes you enough money so that you can have the lifestyle that you want, right? And so my lifestyle is very simple, right? My lifestyle is very, very simple. All I wanted to do was hang out in the studio and tap, tap away. You know, I, I, let me see. If this, is this thing working? Does, it, does this work? Is this on? Yeah. So this is all I wanted to do. I just wanted to sit down in keys and just like come up I just wanted to do this all day long now it's not very expensive to be able to do that. all you need is like a room and one of these and uh, and, and you're straight 
right? So uh, I, I came up with this plan. I had a business plan. And so I think with every entrepreneurial idea or venture, you come up with this business plan. You say, okay, this is how I'm going to make money. This is how much money I need to run my, well, for me, it was my life, right? But this is how much money I need to run my business. And if I could do this, then I'll be straight. I'll be able to get some groceries and live and do exactly what I want to do all day long. Now, luckily for me, I had already understood that what I wanted to do was just play music all day long. That's all I ever wanted to do, right? Now, there are many reasons why I wanted to do this. First of all, just because I grew up in a musical family. But second of all, because when I was in college, right, um, you, know, I, I, you know, I didn't have money or anything. I was always like this, I, I, you know, I, I didn't play football, I didn't play basketball. Um, man, you know, but uh, <clears throat> what was really cool about this is that, you know, I could like sit down at Keys and then all of a sudden, like, girls treated me so much different, right? It's like, <laughs> you know? And I'd be sitting down, I'd be thinking, you know, and, and it was so cool because, you know, being so young at Harvard, right, you know, everybody who was anyone that I could possibly date was two to three years older than I was. And, uh, you know, I listened to a lot of Stevie Wonder and stuff, and I could, you know, sit down and play. And, you know, like I said, girls would start looking at me differently, and I said, man, I could really get used to this, you know. This is going to be awesome. So I, I came up with this business plan. My business plan was that I was going to sell beats, right? So the idea is, you know, they, they have a lot of different uh, solutions now where you can actually sell your beats online. But for me, I didn't have the online ability to be able to do this. So I, I went to Kinko's, which is a copy center, and I made these flyers. And where I was from or where I had, had spent my time in Boston was in Cambridge. So I went out to the hood. You know, so I took the number one bus and went all the way down to Roxbury and I put up my flyers everywhere and my business plan was very simple. I was going to sell five beats a week and I was going to sell my beats at $200 a beat. So five beats a week, that's $1,000 a week, 52 weeks a year, $52,000. I'm doing great. I'm doing just as well as all my other compatriots who had decided to go through the grueling recruitment process. But I was just, you know, selling beats and basically sitting in my little room making these little beats and I was selling them and everything was going to be great and I'd be making as much money as if I was a consultant somewhere at Boston Consulting Group, which is what I actually told my parents I was doing, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, what, what you find in business, though, is that sometimes your projections may be... Uh, uh, how should I say, optimistic, to say the least, right? So what I found is that although I had predicted I would be selling these beats like hotcakes, and what these beats are, just like these little tracks, and you know, people could rap over them or sing on them, and you know, there were a lot of artists, really actually hustlers, right, in the hood. And these were guys that, you know, they, were, they, they, wanted, to clean their, they, they wanted to clean their careers up, right, because you know, they realized there wasn't much of a future in selling drugs, right? Uh, they may potentially end up in jail and stuff, but they also knew that there were a lot of people who were telling these stories of being drug dealers and, you know, all of this other awesome stuff and made for great entertainment on rap records, right? So this is what I was thinking. I was saying, man, there's got to be a huge market for this. And I ended up selling maybe like one beat a month or two a month. And, um, Eventually, well, I was basically homeless and living behind my friend's barber shop, right? And so, um, long story short, I fought, I fought, I fought. Um, I found a couple of folks that I could collaborate with. And uh, eventually, I kind of turned the ship around from being homeless to actually landing a record deal with someone. And it was great. We made some money. And uh, fast forward, I, you know, it was great. We made some money. Uh, I got some exposure. People were like, oh, who's the wonderkin that actually you know, makes all these beats and he's doing awesome songs and everything. It led to a management contract with Puff Daddy. I did two years with him. And uh, one of the things that I realized is I realized that with the advent of new media, the music business was really changing. And so for me, at the very beginning, I, I was really just about how can I actually make as much money as possible in the shortest amount of time so that I could never, ever, ever again have to worry about doing anything except for sitting behind these keys and just playing and you know, having girls look at me and 
love what I did, right? Um, and uh, I realized when I, when, I, when, I, when I got my first publishing deal in New York City, it was uh, from one of the biggest titans of the music business, and his name is Tommy Mottola. Now, Tommy Mottola was once married to Mariah Carey. He was the CEO of Sony Music Corporation. Um, he had a very huge feud with Michael Jackson. He's responsible for some of the biggest you know, success stories in music. And he gave me like, you know, four or $500,000, somewhere in between, the biggest check I'd ever seen in my whole life, right? And I thought to myself, there's no way that this could actually be sustainable. I mean, when you really think about it, it's a huge dice roll on someone's future earnings. And when I looked at the contract, it's a non-returnable, it's an only recoupable uh, advance that they were giving. And so I started to analyze the music business for, 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 for various reasons, most of all just because I didn't believe that this type of income could be sustainable for me, even though I was very happy with it. Right? And so uh, one of the things that happened is under my tenure with Puff Daddy, I was working on all the biggest records. He was producing at the time uh, the soundtrack for the Bad Boys 2 movie with Will Smith and Martin Lawrence. And so all the biggest names in the world were on this. Justin Timberlake, Mary J. Blige, Beyonce. I actually wrote a, uh, produced a record for Beyonce on that soundtrack. And um, in spite of working with all of these big artists, what I was finding is that all the money, once it trickled down to me, was like very, very small. You know, so, you know, there's a huge names, huge advances, huge sales, huge everything, and then it would trickle down to me. And I said, well, you know, this is cool and everything, but um, <laughs> I mean, it's got to be a better way, right? So uh, uh, after, after my two years uh, uh, being managed by Puff Daddy and working for all the, and I, you know, I did everything, Snoop Dogg, Britney Spears, all these big records. Um, I decided that uh, I decided I wanted to try something non-traditional, and so luckily for me, uh, while I was at Harvard, I, I had always been fascinated with the web and the way that it connected people. And so um, I actually had a partner, um, and, and I think one of the most important uh, lessons that I learned is that when you're trying to develop something incredible. It's always great to find collaborators who are at the same level with the same uh, sort of hunger for success that you have, right? Because uh, I get people all the time, right, who are, who are music producers and they say, Ryan, you know, I produce music, I really, I wrote this song and I think it'd be perfect for Beyonce. And I say, well, you know, that's, that's great for you. I think it'd be perfect for Rihanna if it's not for Beyonce. That's great for you too, but it's gonna be very, very challenging to actually get your music to be heard by those people because they already have their own silos of collaborators, right? So for me, what was very uh, uh, lucrative, so to speak, was to find people who were at the same level that I was, that enjoyed the same passion and hunger for success that I did. And they were at the same level. So that means when I picked up the phone and called and said, hey, can you make it to the studio and let's work and let's grind it out and let's do something incredible, they didn't have other way more important things to do. Um, so if I called Rihanna, maybe she has a lot more important things to do. Uh, but if I called my friend Latif, who actually I got my first record contract with, he was just a student who was down the street at Berklee College of Music who loved singing and loved making music, but he needed a collaborator to make his dream come true. Our collaborative efforts created an amazing synergy, which then landed him a record deal, and I got my first, instead of $200 a track, I was making $10,000 a track for seven tracks on his album. So there are some very interesting uh, 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 and amazing synergies that happen when you collaborate with people who are at the same level of hunger for success that you are. And so let's fast forward now, 2004. I had found who I thought was the love of my life, and uh, she had actually uh, uh, asked me, uh, she said, you know, my mom found out that I'm, I'm dating a music producer and, and, and my mom wants to hear what I sound like on record. 
And I said, okay, well, that's easy. Come on by the studio. We'll, you know, we'll cook something up and you'll shoot it off to your mom and she's going to say how awesome it is and that'll get me some favor with the family and it would be great, right? And so uh, I, we made this little record, but there happened to be a guy uh, who was in the, in, in the audience. And so when, when I graduated from school, I, I gave the Harvard oration. And, and, and the gist of my speech was, when you find your passion, the best is going to be demanded of you, not by the expectations of the world, but by the bidding of your heart, just because it's going to be something that drives you forward every single day. And so he was sitting there. He was probably about 18 or 19 himself. And uh, his sister was actually a colleague of mine at school. And he said, you know what? I sat there in that speech and I ended up going home. I went to UC Irvine and I created and he called me, you know, a few years later. He, he said, I created a competitor to Facebook. I said, well, that's great. Um, good luck with that. <laughs> but, but if you read the Facebook, uh, uh, the, there's, there's a book that was written on Facebook. I forget the name of it. But if you read it, you'll see there's a little paragraph, and, and it mentions a site called Collegester. And that's the site that my friend Rashid Richmond had created. Now, uh, in creating that site, he had created kind of an amazing network and link exchange, which... Uh, yielded a, uh, uh, how shall I say, it yielded a result that was kind of unexpected. And that result was the fact that in 2004, we actually had the ability to control the music video keyword, right? So the Google algorithm at that time was actually based on how many sites were linking to a specific destination. And so he had built an incredible network of, uh, of sites. And at the push of a button, he could have all the sites linking to whatever website on the internet he wanted. And so in 2004, I decided, hey, I'm interested in turning the music industry on its head. Now, we're in a room here with folks that really understand numbers. And numbers don't lie, right? So at that time, in order to take a record from completely unknown, or to take an artist from completely unknown to number anything in 1 to 10 on the music charts in the United States, it cost anywhere from $180,000 to $250,000, right? That's how much it costs to take a record to the top 10, right? Just because shh, you have to pay to play, right? Now, now th th this is, this is uh, you know, it's, it's one of the sad things of the music business, right? Because this is just kind of how the infrastructure was set up. You actually had to, and, and, and you didn't pay radio stations directly. You know, you, you, if you've ever been to the United States or you turn on the radio, you'll hear these promotions that say, get paid in the Escalade, caller number five, you're going to win an Escalade, or we're going to pay your rent this month, or whatever. And you think the radio stations are so generous. But really what's happening is that there are record companies that are paying these promotional fees. Hey, hey you want to run a promotion and pay someone's rent. Hey, you want to run a promotion and give away this, et cetera, et cetera. Those promotions and advertisements are actually helping to get their favorite records or your favorite records or what turn into your favorite records because you hear them all the damn time, right? What turn into your favorite records get played all the time. And so my interest was in trying to figure out with this power that we had discovered, could we actually take a record from zero to top 10 in the United States in the radio charts? And what we found is that new media actually creates a way to completely disrupt what we feel is the norm in terms of a business model, right? And so what we did is we actually uh, navigated or pointed and directed everyone's traffic. People, because at the time, that's, that's like the advent of YouTube, right? 2004, 2005. I was like an early YouTube pioneer. They sent me a t-shirt for putting up a bunch of videos on YouTube. I'm very proud of it. I still have it at my house somewhere. Um, but in any case, uh, we actually directed all the music video traffic to Cassie's MySpace profile. And what we saw was, not only did it actually navigate her to the top of the MySpace charts, but because of this ability for people to discover her non-traditionally, there was a certain feeling of organic discovery, right? People actually felt like, oh, I actually discovered this, even though we were manipulating them. But they felt as though they had actually discovered something. And what 
we found is that it created a great domino effect and we watched her plays go from 20 plays a day to 200 plays a day to 200,000 plays a day. And we also watched, we also watched uh, the actual radio spins, which at that time, right, you, you, you had to pay at least probably 10, 20,000, whatever it was, to even get your radio, to get your record to about 500 spins. We started to see this record start popping up on radio for real. And so who calls me, right? This is a great story. I love this part of the story, right? Um, so there I am. I'm in the studio. I'm doing a remix, et cetera. Yeah, you know, I'm living the life. Right? I'm doing everything. You know, I, have, I have a smoking girlfriend. She's, you know, we got a, she's on MySpace. She's the number one MySpace artist. We're turning the music industry upside down. I get a phone call. And the other thing is that, you know, I, I, I'm having fun with this too, right? So um, I had just finished my management contract with Puff Daddy, but I, I had been studying uh, kind of how he worked in New York City. And so um, he has a street team. And so the way that works is like, you know, you go to the clubs every weekend and you give a little money to the DJ and the DJ plays the record like it's the hottest record in the world. He plays like four or five times, right? So, man, so you're in the club, you hear this record, and next thing you know, it's like, oh, man, they're playing this record again. Okay, this must be hot. I'm missing out on something. Oh, this is awesome. All right. So uh, one night, or actually a few nights, there was a guy by the name of Rich Dollars. You find in the music industry, everybody has nicknames. So Rich Dollars, right? I said, Rich Dollars, man, you know, you're still running around with Puffy, right? Yeah, well, listen, I got a couple dollars for you. Here's what I want you to do. Your name is Rich Dollars. I'll give you a few dollars. Um, so so, so what, what I want you to do is um, uh, uh, this weekend, everywhere you go with Puffy, I want you to grease the DJ. I want you to spin this Cassie record. I want him to spin it like eight times, right? So that's what he did. He went, he, Puffy he was going to the clubs, and he's in, he's in Bungalow 8, and all of a sudden he hears this Cassie record three, four times. He says, okay, we're tired of this club. Let's go to the next club. He goes to, 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 to Marquee, whatever the clubs were at the time. The record's spinning eight times. He's looking around, man, what, what is this record? I, what am I missing out? I'm the king of New York. I don't know what this song is. So in any case, in any case uh, I, I, get it, I, I get a phone call the next day, which I was expecting. Right? I get a phone call the next day. Hey, Ryan, um, so uh, I heard you got a new artist, and um, yeah, I heard the record's picking up steam, man. You know, um, sound, yeah. I, I was out last night, I heard it a lot. I, really? You heard this? Wow, it's really picking up out there? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so in any case, he calls me up and he says, yo, Ryan, here's, here's the deal, man. Um, uh, I like what you're doing. I said, well, you know what, Puff, you, you taught me. You taught me get it hot in the streets, and people would call. And so not only have you called, but Jermaine Dupri's called and Tommy Mottola's called and everybody wants to, 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 to have this project. And he says, well, Ryan, you know what, you man, you know, I was your manager and everything. Let's keep it in the family, man. I want to do the deal. I said, well, you know what? You also taught me something else. You got to make me an offer. I can't refuse. Right. <laughs> And so he actually did outbid everybody for this project, and the project went on to be a, a, an experiment, right? This, this is a project, when you really think about it, uh, uh, it was a project which was just an experiment. Hey, Ryan, I want to see what I sound like on record, to, hey, what can we do with the music video keyword, to, hey, can we actually disrupt the economics of taking a record from zero to top ten to selling 650,000 records worldwide? And at that juncture, since I had actually written and produced everything, all the money that was up here actually never trickled down to here. It actually stayed up here, and I was very happy about it, right? So now let's fast forward to now. Let's fast forward to now. Let me take a look at my time here. Okay, cool. So let's fast forward to now. Um, so here I was uh, in, in, in the mid-2000s and thinking I was so far ahead of everybody in the music business, right? And then uh, we had built and amassed this huge 650,000 person following for Cassie on MySpace. And then all of a sudden, in the blink of an eye, MySpace became a graveyard. And Cassie actually has never even released another album since, right? Now, there's a lot of factors that go into this. But I would say probably the number one factor that uh, plays into the reason why she hasn't released another album at least from my vantage point, is the fact that the 650,000 people who wanted to be friends with Cassie on MySpace, once, Ca once MySpace became a graveyard, we couldn't reach those people anymore, right? And then I, I started very early to understand that something 
is wrong once again with the music business. And so I think what we could do right now is we could take a look at the next slide. Kyle, right, we just take it to the next slide. And what is wrong with the music business? Well, is iTunes really wrong with the music business, right? So I used to have breakfast with uh, Doug Morris. Doug Morris was the former chairman of Universal Music Group, right? And he had an amazing office, and he would invite me to breakfast, and we'd sit down at breakfast, and uh, we would be overlooking Central Park, and he would say, man, Steve Jobs is such a bastard, <laughs> right? And the reason why he would say this is because he felt as though, um, and you know, I would always remind him, I said, well, you, you, you could have made a different deal with Steve, you know, you could have made a different deal. The music industry could have had a different arrangement with Apple and iTunes, right? But uh, I, I think really the main reason why, I mean, obviously, don't get me wrong, he had a great deal of respect, as, as all of us do, uh, for the genius and the legend that Steve Jobs is, right? But what he was finding is that uh, iTunes was quickly becoming the number one distribution outlet for the records that they were creating. And what we were finding, uh, and what I'm finding today, in creating a solution and an alternative to iTunes, and this sounds crazy, you know, it's like it's a David and Goliath story, right? How does one independent artist, right? Because I'm independent, I actually bought my contract out in 2010, I've been going independent since then. How does one independent artist decide, I'm gonna load up my slingshot and I'm going to fire a rock into the forehead of a giant in the music business, which is iTunes, right? And I think on a very simple level, the reason is because being an independent artist or being a business, I believe, especially if you want to build a lifestyle business, which is what I wanted to build, I would go back to my very simple idea that I need customers and I need to be able to communicate with them, right? I need to be able to efficiently communicate with them and I need to be able to own my relationship with them, right? So uh, what, what we see here is that uh, there's been a lot of songs that have been sold, a lot of countries. Uh, and when I want to communicate with the people who actually buy my albums, I'm unable to do so, right? So I'm an independent artist. I released an album last year. I've been clipping along at 15,000 albums every quarter. And I decided I was going on tour and I actually wanted to email everybody who bought my album because I figured, well, this is going to be great. The people who bought my album want to see me on tour. So I went to iTunes. I said, well, can I get the emails? Because I just want to email everyone, let them know, hey, I'm coming on tour. They're all going to be excited and they're all going to go buy tickets. And they said, well, no, it's against our privacy policy. So uh, that really rose a red flag in my mind that I actually don't own the consumer insights which make every other company especially in a digital media and new media age that make them successful, right? So let, 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 let's take actually any other company. We, we could take Apple, obviously, because we're looking at it, but let's take, uh, in the United States, one of the huge players in mobile is Verizon. Anyone who has a, a cell phone contract, if they want to reach you, right, they don't tweet at you, or they don't post on their Facebook profile, hey, the Verizon Facebook profile, we got a new deal for you. Literally, they just send you an email, you look in the email, if you want to take advantage of the offer, you click the link and boom, now you've got more free text messaging or family and friends, whatever you want to, whatever, whatever you want to call it. If you look at the airline industry, if you buy a plane ticket, right, they're not tweeting at you, they're not on their Facebook profile, hey, we've got an update for you, no. They send you an email because they actually know and they own the consumer relationship. We can talk about Amazon, we can talk about Apple, we can talk about Starbucks, we can talk about Dell, we can talk about all of these great success stories in the digital age, right? But as a musician or as a record company, we simply don't own our consumer insights. We can go to the next slide. The other piece of this, which I find to be so exciting, right, is that iTunes as a distributor also charges me 30% for every album I sell, right? So this is a very, very interesting arrangement, right? Because I spent all my money making a nice album and everything, and then I hand it over to iTunes and they take $3 for every album that they distribute for me. Now, we're in the digital age. 
If you've ever wanted to send an album, if you want to email an album to someone, right, it's very easy to do so, and you could do so free of charge, right? But if you want to do so within the iTunes distribution platform, they actually charge you 30%, and they justify that 30% because they're getting so much traffic, right? But for an independent artist, and for many independent artists around the world, the only way that someone knows that their album is in iTunes is because they tell them that it's in iTunes, right? And so, in essence, they may or may not be sending customers to iTunes, right? But when they send a customer to iTunes, two things happen. One, iTunes charges $3 for the uh, sale. And number two, iTunes takes their consumer information and then sells them someone else's record, right? And we don't get a percentage of the record that they sold of someone else's, right? But we, 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 we still give them the information just because as independent artists, we want to be able to say, hey, our record is on iTunes. It's very easy to send people to go there and they can search it and find it, right? Next slide. So I decided, for me, I wanted to try something once again. I had done it before. Could I do this again? Could I actually disrupt the model for the music business? Could it be possible? And I found out that the answer was yes. So I came home from a tour. I did a tour. And I sat down and I did a crash course in a programming language called Ruby on Rails. Anyone familiar with it? Yeah, Ruby. Love Ruby, right? Um, <laughs> Yeah, Ruby's my new girlfriend, right? Uh, so anyway, uh, yeah, so, 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 so um, basically, in a very, very simple fashion, I, I programmed a companion database application, which basically serves as a CRM. Now, this may seem like such a very, very simple concept. Why? Because Salesforce has already built a billion dollar enterprise out of it, CRM, right? But it's never been applied to the music business. And this is really where the breakthrough um, can be apparent, right? Is applying a best practice from another industry to an industry that's underserved, right? And so for about $3,000 in help, because I eventually needed to call some friends to actually help me get this to where I wanted it to be. I was able to actually connect to the APIs of a few uh, partners around the net to start to build a very comprehensive consumer profile for anyone who actually legally bought my album. Right? So we can go to the next slide. So uh, we partnered with a company called Shopify. Shopify actually handles our storefront, and as you can see, my album is there for sale directly from me. I am the retailer. It doesn't cost me $3 to sell my album to anyone. Next slide. And anytime someone actually buys my record, it gives me an update, right? So uh, anytime someone buys my record, anytime someone buys one of the sweatshirts, anytime someone buys a ticket, I get an update right on my phone. Next slide. And what's cool about this is that I can actually now see exactly what's happening with my fans around the world. This is pretty awesome, right? But the other piece about this is that if Twitter became a graveyard, much like MySpace did, and I know they're about to do an API, I'm uh, sorry, they're about to do an IPO, <laughs> API, IPO, an IPO, and, uh, and uh, 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 if it became a graveyard tomorrow, the fans or the consumers to whom I have access here, I actually own this relationship, right? So this is, very, this is a very, very beautiful thing, right? So Facebook dies tomorrow, Twitter dies tomorrow. And mind you, Facebook charges me all the time whenever I want to reach more than you know, the little number of people that I can reach right now. I have 390,000 likes, but you know, my engagement is so low. There's so many other pages on Facebook. If you really want to reach people, you can pay them and they, they will promote your post. But for these people, I can reach them directly, right? And uh, I have different products in my store. And from just 5,000 fans, I've already raised, and actually it's, it's a little bit different now because that was in the 16th of September. So a month later, I'm actually up to about maybe $110,000 already. Take it to the next slide. Yeah. Okay. So what's also cool about this is I actually can 
now figure out and see who my top fans are around the world, right? So, and, and I can segment them down. So how many people bought my album in New York? How many people bought my album in Germany? 790, I think there's more than that now, but. Um, and I'm on tour, and it actually helps me to make much better business decisions. Now, for all of you out there, you say, well, man, this is just, I mean, this is so obvious. This is, this is of course, you can, you can see everything, you can make better business decisions. This has never, ever happened in the music industry before, right? We've never had these insights. So if we look at a, an artist, Jay-Z's new artist, his name is J. Cole. His first album, he sold 630,000 records. When I went to Rock Nation, I said, well, how many of those people could you reach if you pressed the button? They say, well, maybe about 30,000. That's not even 5%, right? It's not even 5%. So I say, well, how do you reach the 630,000 people who've already bought the album when he, ever, he wants to put out a new album? Oh, well, they spend millions and millions of dollars to try to market and then recapture customers that they have already acquired, right? Which is just totally inefficient. And I've, I've been... Uh, I, I've been participating in this in the music business, and I said, well, maybe I'll be late to the party, but once I'm in the party, right, because now I'm in the party, I'm not going to be leaving anytime soon, right? <laughs> Go to the next slide. Okay, so I can see my revenue, I can see breakdowns, I mean, all of this makes very, it, it makes total sense, I can see how many records I've sold. One of the most interesting pieces of this is that we sold my album as a membership to kind of a fan club. And what's interesting about this here is that on 5,000 records, I've made $12 a record, I've made $60,000. If I distributed those albums through iTunes, let's say I just charged because iTunes is actually going to restrict what I can even charge for an album. They say I can only charge 10 bucks for an album, right? Let's say I sold them through iTunes. It would cost me $3 a record. So for those 5,000 records to distribute to my 5,000 fans, it would cost me $15,000, right? To distribute those records directly from me cost me $22, right? So I saved myself $14,978, and I actually have all the consumer insights, right? I actually know every single person, and whatever information they've chosen to give me, to give me, I actually have that information. Next slide. All right? So I can see who my people are, if I want to email Asli Han, if I want to text her, call her, if I want to see what she's been up to, I can see on Instagram and Twitter what she's into, other music she's listening to. Very cool and awesome. Next slide. And what's also very awesome about this is, from a marketing standpoint, one of our other partners is, is MailChimp. And so we're going to take a look here uh, at uh, metrics, right? So. What we did is we actually, we did a test here, and we did a test, and the test was, I had 973 people in the database at the time. How many bad emails do I have? How many bad emails do I have? Most entertainment mailing lists, right, they have about 50% bad emails, right, because people are signing up, oh, I'll sign up to get a free download, right? Oh, I put my email in, I get a free download. Because these people actually transacted with me, I have zero bad emails, when I send an email, I get a 100% delivery rate, right? Go to the next slide. The number of people who actually open my email, because it's from me, 84%. The industry average, 25%. The number of people who actually click my offer, 63%. The industry average, 3.5%, right? So what we're doing on a very small scale is actually turning the music industry on its head how quickly does it take? How fast can you get to a million dollars with this system? Well, if you have 10,000 fans around the world who are willing to transact with you at 100 bucks, you're at a million dollars in revenue, right? I sat down with Pusha T. Pusha T is one of Kanye West's new artists. He just released his new album. I said, Pusha T, how long is it going to take you to get to a million dollars in record royalties in your current deal? He said, well, man, I'll have to probably have to sell a million to a million and a half records. Well, I told him, well, with my system, I'll get to that same level of, uh, of revenue with probably about 1% of the people. Why? Because I can effectively communicate with them and market to them. So, I mean, it's a very, you know, it's kind of a very simple idea. It's, it's the CRM model, which is applied to an industry that in many ways has been archaic. Yeah, we're cool, we're awesome, we get to wear all black, we have entourages, Rolexes, gold chains.
<laughs> but, but in many ways, we're kind of behind the eight ball when it comes to using technology to make our business more efficient. And so, um, you know, in, in, in closing, in closing, a lot of folks say, well, Ryan, yeah, this, is, this, is, this has turned your business around. It's cool. It's awesome. It's great for you. But uh, what, what, is, this, is this a real business model? And so for me, with zero marketing, with just a tweet, right? I, I, on the 4th of July, I sent out a tweet and I said, if you're a musician or an artist or a producer or someone who's a creator and you're not getting the results you want from social media, which most people aren't, you usually get about a 1% conversion on social media, and you have the money to invest in an enterprise solution which can actually create an infrastructure for you to run a multi-million dollar business straight off the iPhone, give me a ring. And so we actually had a lot of independent artists actually filled out a questionnaire which said, hey, this is what I'd like to do, this is what I love doing, this is what I've tried, I've tried YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, none of these things are working for me. And we actually have a waiting list right now at $45 a month, right? We have a waiting list right now of about 1,000 artists, right? Which is $45,000 a month recurring. It cost me $3,000 to make this thing, right? But really, I think the lesson in this is when you provide value, when you can create real value, right? These are real numbers. This is, this is my real story. It's real numbers. And I have countless other case studies of kids that only had 400 Twitter followers. And within six weeks, they generated $18,750 just by having the right consultation and business strategy around their approach to monetizing their fan base. When you provide value, the world returns the value to you. So I, I get pitches all the time. People actually, if you go on my Twitter, you can actually email me directly, text me directly. Um, we have a partnership with Twilio, which is one of my favorite companies. Um, but I get pitches all the time of pe people that say, oh, I'm an entrepreneur. I have this idea. I think it's an awesome idea. And really, it's only an awesome idea to them and maybe like the two other people that, are, that they're working on, uh, uh, that they are working with on the idea. And uh, the question in my mind is always, what value are you actually providing? And this actually trickles down to even me and music, right? Ryan, how could you sell more records? How could you, what value are you actually providing to the world? And for me, in a very small package, we're providing an incredible value to a group of creators who up to this point just haven't had a way to make sense of all of the traction that they're getting online. And so uh, Active Fan is going to be a very awesome journey for me for the next uh, couple of months and years. And for me, me just taking 5,000 records out of iTunes may not be significant. But if I'm able to actually do this for 1,000 artists or 10,000 artists or 100,000 artists, our real goal is just to get to what I started this company for in the first place, and that is to own the relationship with my consumers. And so if at some point, and I want you guys to watch for this, if at some point we can actually bring a company like iTunes or Amazon to the level where they would actually give us just a checkbox that says, would you like Ryan Leslie to know that you bought his CD? I would consider this company a success. Thank you so much for your time, for listening. And my name is Ryan Leslie. Thank you. Thank you so much to, uh, to Ryan Leslie. That was, I think, one of the most passionate talks we've ever uh, heard at uh, Idea Lab. Will you prepare something for you? <laughs> and, um, Thank you. I don't know, will, you will be leaving uh, very soon now? Or? Yeah, but I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll hang out for a little bit. I'm actually, um, I'm performing tonight uh, at a club called Index in Schüttorf. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, I do. Um, um, if you go to my store, you'll see that there's a, there's a meet and greet, and so there's people who actually got meet and greet tickets, and they, they want to come to the sound check and, and see that. But I'll hang out for a little bit. If, there, if, there, if there's anyone that's, that's interested in this space, um, that, that loves 
uh, creativity and loves the intersection of creativity and technology and all of the incredible possibilities that are going to be formed from this intersection. I'd love to hear from you. I'd, lo I'd love to talk to you. And also, um, like I said, my, my, my direct email and phone number. Actually, you know, if you, have a, if you have your phones, you want to put my phone number in, you can send me a text message. You will get a message or a marketing message to buy my album. But after that, I will actually get your, uh, I will actually get your, I will actually get your message. And I do respond to everyone. So um, if you just want to write it down, it's, it's an American number. It's plus one, nine one five, six hundred six nine seven eight plus one nine one five six hundred six nine seven eight feel free to call me well actually text me because I will email you back because uh, my number is a Twilio number I'll just be real <laughs> it's a Twilio number but I do get all the messages um, and, and they go into my email and uh, my email is ryan at renegadesnyc.com renegades r-e-n-e-g a D E S N Y C dot com. Shoot me an email um, in, in the event that we don't get to actually talk in person while we're here. But yeah, I, I will stick around for a little bit. Um. Okay, so maybe we can take uh, one question. Yeah, we audience? can take questions. I got time. Yeah, okay, yeah. so somebody has a really yeah, good yeah. question. I love questions. Yeah. In the back. Hi, Ron. Uh, thank you so much. Um, What's your personal advice for young founders? Your, the, the best personal advice you can give to, to young people, I guess. Okay, he asked, what's the best personal advice you can give to young people? Well, for me, it is invest the time. Invest the time that's necessary to, number one, find what keeps you up at night, right? So for me, if you, uh, there's a little documentary about my latest album, um, and um, I, actually, I actually practice polyphasic sleep, right? And so during my time at Harvard, when I was pre-med, uh, there were so many young people that were so passionate about medicine, right? They never wanted to sleep. And I said, well, I mean, this is cool and everything, but I, you need to sleep, right? So, so, so they said, well, Ryan, well, actually, we don't. You know, there's a way that you only have to sleep three hours a night, and you can get, you know, two 30-minute naps, and it works. And, and so, um, yeah, I, I, I learned this with them. And um, uh, I, I found very quickly that, like, you know, cutting up small animals and things like that wasn't, it just didn't keep me up at night. I would prefer to sleep. Um, and then I, I moved to macroeconomics and a bunch of finance guys that were so excited about foreign markets and they wanted to be awake when the foreign markets were changing and they were trading currencies. And so they were also practicing polyphasic sleep. And, and, and so um, I found that what really kept me up at night, right? was solving not only problems of like, okay, how do these core structures fit together, but also figuring out how I could actually make the best living I possibly could doing what I love to do. And so I would say, as a founder, try to find that which you are really passionate about. And even if it means not jumping into something for a year, going exploring the world, taking an internship somewhere, going and, and really actually writing an email to a mentor because with new media now, you can actually reach everyone, right? I can, I can, I can literally reach everyone if I'm persistent enough. Go and explore and find what you're most passionate about. When you're most passionate, that's when you're going to actually deliver the most value to the world because it's coming from within. That's what I would say. Yeah, you got yeah, yeah. yeah. Do okay, we have so another question? We'll take one last question. We'll take, we'll take, let's say we take three to five more questions. We have that uh, oh, oh, yeah. Well, okay, I'm sorry. I'm taking up other people's time. Okay, yeah, yeah. Hi. Hi. So first of all, why don't you perform here? Why don't I perform here? Yeah, and second of all, what do you think about... <laughs> okay. Secondly, what do you think about um, artists' perception uh, towards technology in general? So why are they still releasing records and albums? Uh, and, and what do you also think about things like SoundCloud and Spotify? Man, um, I, wa I watched... Uh, Sorry, a lot of questions. That, that's a loaded question. So should we start with the <laughs> performance? <Yeah. laughs> All right. All right. So... Um, 
Yeah, so so what's cool about about This is from the new album, it's called Full Moon. I asked the Lord to forgive me for the sins I commit. My mom prayed I gave her that bends with the tent. <laughs> My father prayed I gave him five stacks for his trouble. First class flights to Aruba for the couple, yeah. They raised me to be everything that I could be. Lost a milli, got right back up from it like a G. Ain't no one in my stratosphere far as I can see. Me and my girl be arguing, homie, I can see. What's love got to do with anything? When the moment you away, you be hiding your wedding ring, huh? How that pain feel? When she find out everything you told her ain't real. Take it from me, I got these lies on my head. These wives on my bed. They lying too, they just don't realize what they said. Just broke the heart of they man. Broke the heart of they lover. They playing in the shadows, we do it under the cover of the full moon. Full moon, full moon. Under cover of the full moon. Under cover of the full moon, full moon, full moon. Under cover of the full moon, full moon, full moon, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 